So we would like to welcome everyone to um, this afternoon's event with our teacher. Um, we would like to invite everyone to, um, to sit comfortably. Uh, maybe you can turn off your laptops and your cell phones for now. <laughs> and um, to just allow yourself some time to, to be away from those things <laughs> for a little bit, to be able to really relax your mind um, and to really be able to just um, be present um, for yourself. <laughs> Um, today we would like to um, practice together with you um, some mindfulness songs. And um, when we sing these songs, um, please really practice them. <laughs> they are um, the first song that we will learn is um, breathing in, breathing out. And um, so when you're doing the song, there are some hand movements to it. And you can also do that to really just relax your body. And um, when you sing the song, you can just say, breathing in, breathing out. And then breathing in, breathing out. And when we say that um, we are blooming as a flower, really see yourself bloom as a flower. Um, you don't need to imagine. <laughs> I see that we are, we are all like flowers, especially when we smile. So when we say that we are blooming as a flower, really see yourself bloom as a flower. And remember to smile. <laughs> And um, when we say that we are as solid as a mountain, really feel yourself grounded. Because when we are grounded and when we have, um, and we really be able to be in touch with this um, peace inside of us, we're very solid, like a mountain. <laughs> Maybe we can start. <laughs> quite good <laughs> but I think we can hear you even louder if you try we just had a wonderful tour of your buildings here and we were learning that that part of your wish is to bring the outside inside and this this song is an active practice of bringing these qualities from the outside the qualities of the flower the mountain still water and the earth bringing them deep inside your heart and touching them right here and right now so uh, 
we invite you to at least do the hand movements with us. And as you can tell, the song, song lyrics are very simple, so you can join in where you can. We'll so the words are breathing in, breathing out. I am blooming as a flower. I am fresh as the dew. If you like, you can close your eyes and you can visualize these qualities in, inside yourself. I am blooming as a flower. I am fresh as the dew. I am solid as a mountain. I am firm as the earth. I am free, I am free. Breathing in, breathing out. I am water reflecting what is real and what is true. I feel. <laughs> and I feel <laughs> there is space <laughs> deep inside of me. All of us, we have these qualities and we just need to get in touch with them in order to wake them up a little bit. And we can do that together now. <laughs> Thank you. We know that this works. That's why we're sharing it with you, and we just want to share this, this experience with you today, too. We, we have another song. Mm -hmm. So this song is, uh, is a wonderful practice to be able to learn the basic tools of meditation. So the words to the song are also actually a guided meditation. And so as we sing this song together, the words are very simple. There's only about eight of them. Uh, you can close your eyes and really arrive with each, uh, each note and each word and really get the feeling of the words. Um, it's, the words are in, so this means you're breathing in. Out, you're breathing out. Deep, slow, calm, ease, smile, release. Release means we let go of all our worries. We let go of all the things, the emails we haven't answered, the work that we're meant to be doing right now. <laughs> and we arrive right here and just enjoy it.
please, please join in to help you realize the fruit of this practice. Okay, we have a third and final song we'd like to share with you. It's about touching our happiness <laughs> and realizing that we have uh, nowhere to go and nothing to do. So we really want to bring our full concentration and presence to, to our time together. And uh, touching our happiness and not being in a hurry and not feeling dispersed and wanting to go anywhere is how we do it. So. We, we like to do it by singing as well, so <laughs> please join us. too high. <laughs> <laughs>
So, dear friends, we will now have a chance to uh, experience a guided meditation together. So, I, I wonder if um, the, the seats here at the front that are empty, are they available? Uh, would people like to, are they, are they reserved? They're reserved for some invisible friends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wherever you are, you can be fully present there. We know you're not a ghost. <laughs> so, um, uh, our sister will maybe give some guidance on how to sit, in particular with your feet touching the ground. And you may like to move forward a little bit on, on your chair. We'd like to invite the monastic brothers and sisters to come up to practice sitting meditation on the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear friends. We're going to have a brief guided meditation um, so that we can come in touch with the peace, calmness, and stillness in ourselves. So um, please sit comfortably, sit upright. You might want to close your eyes so that you can concentrate better on your breathing. You may want to bring your attention to the air coming in, the air coming out of your nose. This is something that we can do throughout the day. We can find a minute here and there in the day to come back to ourselves whether we are in, in the office, in our workspace in the office, or whether we are sitting at a traffic light, a red traffic light, that we can take the opportunity to rest. We can take the opportunity to relax our body and our mind. And, um, and it's quality time with ourselves. And simply enjoy your in-breath, enjoy the out-breath. And if you notice yourself thinking about something, worrying about something, just simply smile to that thought and let it go. And stay with your breathing. Breathing in. I know I'm breathing in, breathing out, I know I'm breathing out, in, out. Breathing in, I'm aware of my abdomen rising. Breathing out, I'm aware of my abdomen falling. Abdomen rising, abdomen falling.
Breathing in, I'm aware of my whole body. Breathing out, I relax my whole body. I smile to my body and I release all the tension and tightness that may be there in my body. Aware of body, relaxing body. Aware, breathing in, I'm aware of my heart. Breathing out, I smile with gratitude to my heart. Aware of heart, smiling with gratitude. Breathing in, I dwell fully in the present moment. Breathing out, I know this is a wonderful moment. 
present moment, wonderful moment. Breathing in, I'm aware that I'm alive. Breathing out, I smile to life. Aware of being alive, smiling to life. You're invited very warmly to, to stand up as our, as our teacher enters. Thank you. Dear friends, there's also some spaces at the front. If, even if those spaces are reserved, it seems those people aren't coming. If there's an empty space next to you, would you like to lift your hand up? 
So if anyone's in the overflow room or in this hall, please come forward to fill the spaces. Thank you. Looks like there's about 10 or 12. Please keep your hands raised if there's sit down. space next to you. Thank you, please sit down. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this <coughs> moment. I want to thank the monastics of Deer Park Monastery for singing and leading us in breath work. Such practices bring us into the moment. Many of us are here to deepen our ability to be fully present, to be in that stream of that profound, simple, yet elusive condition of awareness that results from mindfulness. And to learn that from one who embodies it, Thich Nhat Hanh. I have to honestly say I've, I've never been in Charlie's when it's been this quiet <laughs> for this long. It's, it's a beautiful quality. I'm Liv Wu. I'm a cook at Google. I teach yoga. I do some writing. Standing here, I'm letting the fullness of this moment wash over me. I know that several of us have at your side friends and family, some from all the way across the country. Welcome to all of you as we converge at this time and place. It's unique for Silicon Valley to bring into our midst a Buddhist monk, this great teacher, Thai agreed to come in part because of who we are. Googlers who are open to engaging each other, doing the right thing, and bringing forth bright sparks. Thich Nhat Hanh knows our ethos, and he knows it could be renewed by mindfulness. When we reached out to him, his itinerary was already set, yet Ty was willing to reconfigure his North American tour to come to us. In his wisdom, he refused to do just a talk. He wanted us to practice mindfulness. In other words, he wanted us to walk the talk. Not just some cerebral tech talk, but to do it to do mindfulness. And sure enough, when we opened reservations for this event, we were fully booked in less than 24 hours. We hunger for health. We hunger for a happiness that sustains us in our bodies, in our families, and in our workplace. We seek longevity and productivity in the workplace and in relationships. Work and life are interrelated the life force from one flows into the other. I belong to a self-formed group at Google that uh, called the Compassionati. And we believe that wisdom practices and a commitment to personal growth can realign our company and our culture with our core beliefs and sustain us as we grow. When I cook, I am rooting myself in the moment. The foods that I handle 
are expressions of time and place, of a seed, sunlight, water, air, and earth. An arrangement of carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, and hundreds of compounds and their interaction brings them before me. They have been stewarded by the caring hands of local small producers and now go through mine and become an offering to those at my table. And this is true of all the cooks who cook for me and my colleagues that, and all the foods that we put before you. You and I and our nourishment intersect in a web of life. This work makes me aware of how in interdependent we are, how as conscious beings we have a way of being with each other and maybe even healing each other in times of personal crises. Tonight, we have the great gift of Ty's offering if we choose to walk this path. He has embodied for 85 years peace, activism, vital health, big thinking, a directed life, diverse talents, and long-lived productivity. I will turn over his introduction to Dr. Lillian Chung, who knows him well. She's the co-author of Savor, Mindful Eating, Mindful Life. By the way, that's for sale um, in the back later if you'd like. Without Lillian, we would not have Ty here today. She's the one who made this happen, and I'm very grateful to her. She will, as well, give us the scientific perspective of mindfulness and health. Lillian Chong is a lecturer and director of health promotion and communication at the Harvard School of Public Health's Department of Nutrition. She received the Doctor of Science in Nutrition at the Harvard School of Public Health and is a registered dietitian. She is co-investigator at the Harvard Prevention Research Center on Nutrition and Physical Activity and is the founder and editorial director of the Nutrition Source Harvard's website on nutrition. Lillian has uh, authored scores of peer-reviewed scientific papers, as well as nutrition articles for mass media. Yet her investigation was incomplete until she found her own path through mindfulness. And she found it through Thich Nhat Hanh. To me, she's that perfect balance of humanity. She's both a person of science, and a person of spirit. Lillian. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia, for your kind introduction and your leadership in making this very special event today a reality. Dear Tai, and hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here with you today at Google. I would like to share with you how this event came into being. How many of you in Google have seen this food pyramid in the Google cafes? Okay, that's good. Did you ever wonder how it ended up in Google cafes all around the world? My colleagues at the Harvard School of Public Health created the Healthy Eating Pyramid. And it's based on the latest science about how our food choices affect our health. And since 2009, the Google culinary team, including Olivia Wu, have been working with us, the Harvard team, led by our chairman of the nutrition department, Dr. Walter Willett, to offer you the science-based information and to ensure healthy choices in all Google cafes. Not too long ago, 
Olivia and I were talking about the appropriate dessert serving sizes in Google cafes. And I pointed out that while portion sizes and types of desserts are important, many of us are still driven by our ingrained unhealthy eating habits. We are not lacking of information on what's good for us. The problem lies more with our hectic multitasking and stressful modern lives. Many of us rarely pay attention to what we eat, why we are eating what we eat, how we eat, and how much we eat. Why does this matter? Well, it has significant implications for us as individuals, as well as for us as part of the global community. I am sure it's no news to you that you are in the, we are in the midst of a worldwide obesity epidemic. In 2008, about one-fifth of our world population was overweight or obese, and that's one and a half billion people worldwide. In the United States, one out of three adults is obese. And scientists estimate that if the obesity epidemic is not controlled, half of all American adults will be obese by 2030. Why is this alarming? Obesity affects every organ in our bodies and it increases the risk of major chronic diseases such as diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, heart disease, and depression. This is a major concern for health care, as the system may be overwhelmed to the breaking point. According to one estimate, Americans will spend more than 300 billion dollars per year by 2020 on obesity-related problems. Furthermore, if we do not turn the obesity epidemic around, scientists predict this generation of children may have a shorter lifespan than their parents. We currently also have a stress epidemic in the U.S. A 2009 national survey indicated that three out of four American adults reported moderate to high levels of stress, a state I'm sure many of you can relate to. Stress adversely affects our whole being. It affects our immune and cardiovascular systems. It's linked to back pain, headaches, and stomach problems. And it's also associated with obesity and overeating. What are some of the factors that contribute to obesity? One major factor is our food environment. We live in a toxic food environment, and many of us are not fully aware of it. We are surrounded by abundant, supersized, highly processed foods and drinks that are easy to access. Scientists are investigated and are actually investigating now whether these highly processed foods can cause neurological changes. These changes can lead to a state that scientists call condition overeating or hypereating. We overeat 24-7, overriding our sense of fullness again and again. 
we also live in a toxic media environment. Our senses are constantly bombarded with stimuli and commercials driving us to eat more of the wrong foods and move less. We need to find a way to stop living our lives on autopilot. People from all walks of life have been practicing mindfulness for thousands of years. And this is a good solution to keep us on the healthy eating and healthy living track while reducing our stress. Yet scientists just recently shown interest in investigating how mindfulness affects our health. For example, in year 1999, the National Institute of Health only funded three studies. And in the year 2010, they funded over 100 studies. And areas of diverse research include the effects of mindfulness practice on stress reduction, depression, heart flashes, addiction, irritable bowel syndrome, parenting, diabetes, cancer survival, and weight management. There are ongoing studies suggesting that mindfulness practice can change our brain. While these scientific studies are young, the practice of mindfulness is old. It is ancient wisdom that stands the test of time. My first wonderful taste of mindfulness came during a 1997 retreat with Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh in Key West, Florida. It was a week-long retreat entitled Opening the Door to Healing and Transformation. At that time, I was totally stressed out by work and family demands. But as I followed the simple practices at the retreat, my stress evaporated and I could touch my inner peace. At the end of the retreat, Ty said, some of you may have touched peace in this retreat, but if you don't continue to practice, you will lose it all. As a good student, I took it to heart and have been practicing ever since. During the same retreat, I had a ha-ha moment. I realized that the missing piece to help people change their unhealthy eating habits is mindfulness. Over the years, I had the privilege of learning and collaborating with Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh to weave together ancient wisdom and modern science to help improve our own well-being and the well-being of our world. The outcome of this unique collaboration and adventure is our book, Savor Mindful Eating, Mindful Life. Now, you will have a really precious opportunity to learn about mindfulness directly and practice mindfulness together with Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. We call him Thai, Vietnamese word for teacher. Thai is one of the most respected and recognized Zen masters of our time. He is a poet, an artist, and author of numerous best-selling books. Thai writes beautiful calligraphy with brushes like the one, the title that we have over here. And Thai is also one of the founders of the Engaged Buddhism Movement, helping to bring peace personally and globally to the world. And as he wrote in this beautiful calligraphy, another one, peace in oneself 
peace in our world. His teaching has reached a global audience and is non-sectarian. Being a dedicated peace activist and human rights advocate, his lifelong efforts to promote peace and conciliation moved Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to nominate him for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1967. For the next few hours, you will learn how to integrate the practice of mindfulness into your daily life. Not just when you're sitting on the meditation cushion, but also while you work, play, eat, and walk. You will learn that practicing mindfulness is not just an individual matter. Practicing mindfulness is also a collective matter. Both personal and social responsibilities are needed for broad positive changes in our society. With mindfulness, we will realize that each one of us can be an agent of change. Each one of us can contribute towards the sea change in our world that supports the well-being of all in this generation and beyond. We are extremely grateful and fortunate that Ty, together with his brothers and sisters, have taken time out of their busy North American teaching tour to be here with us today at Google. They bring along wonderful, serene mindfulness energy. This is a very special day. Without further ado, let's savor our mindfulness journey together with Thai. Dear friends, in Plum Village, uh, France, where we live uh, and practice, every time we hear the sound of the bell, we stop our thinking, we stop our talking, and we go back to our uh, in-breath and breathe mindfully. 
and uh, at least uh, three times. In, out. And that uh, practice is it's called uh, listening to uh, the bell, the sound, the bell of mindfulness. When uh, you hear the bell, you naturally stop your thinking. It has become a habit. You naturally stop your thinking, and you focus your attention on your in-breath, and you enjoy breathing in. And when you breathe in mindfully like that, you bring your mind home to your body and you become fully alive in the here and the now. It takes only three seconds in order to bring the mind home to the body and establish ourselves in the here and the now. And when you are well established in the here and the now, you can get in touch with life, first of all, your body, your feelings, your perceptions, your mental uh, formations, your consciousness. And you get in touch with uh, the wonders of life around you. The energy of mindfulness uh, has the power to heal, to transform. When you love someone, you have the tendency to offer him or her something. You want to make him or her happy. And um, you are inhabited by the energy of love. And that is why you have the, the desire to make uh, him or her happy. As I have said, Love has the power to heal, to nourish, to bring happiness, and to transform suffering. And the practice of mindfulness can produce love. The true, the real, the true elements of true love can be produced by the practice of mindfulness. And when you have that love in you, you are alive, you are peaceful, you are happy, and you can make the other person happy. Usually, uh, when we want to make the other person happy, we want to give him or her something. We may write a poem for him, for her, or we may um, uh, cook something good and give to him or to her, or you may go to the market and buy something. But the, but the most uh, precious thing you can give him or her is not something you can buy from the market. It's not something that you can buy by uh, with money. It's your true presence. You have to be there for him and for her if you truly love him or her. And in order to be there, you need the practice of mindfulness. And what you want to offer 
Your beloved one is your true presence. How can you love if you are not there? To love means to be there for him or for her. And to, bear, to be there is a practice. In the Buddhist tradition, when you begin to breathe in mindfully, you bring your mind home to your body. And when mind and body are together, you are truly there. In our daily life, very often our body is there, but our mind is not there. We are not truly there. It's impossible to love if you are not there. So uh, practice mindful breathing. Bring your mind home to your body. It can help you to be there. Our uh, in-breath, our out-breath is something like uh, a bridge linking mind and body. And the moment when we pay attention to our in-breath and breathe in mindfully, we bring our mind home to our body and we are there in just two or three seconds. And um, you can look, you can go to your beloved one, looking in your in his eyes or her eyes, and you can say, darling, I'm here for you. Your presence is the most precious gift that you can make to your beloved one. There is an 11 year old boy who is unhappy because his father is not there for him. His father is a very rich businessman, successful uh, businessman too. But he does not have time for himself, for his wife and his, uh, his uh, son. That day he, he said, my son, Tomorrow will be your birthday, right? Do you want anything? I will buy it for you. The young man did not know how to answer. He did not need anything. His father can afford to buy anything he wanted, but he did not need anything. He needed one thing, the presence of his father. From time to time, his father is there at home, but his mind is not with his body. So the young man has the impression that he does not really have a father. So after some reflection, he said, Daddy, it's you, it's you that I want. And if the father knows uh, the practice of mindful breathing, he will begin to breathe in mindfully, and it takes only three seconds for him to be there, body and mind together. And looking into the eyes of his son, he said, darling, I'm here for you. It's very easy. Everyone can do that. To me, to love means to be there for your beloved one. And to be there for me is not a a willing a intention, a desire, that is a practice. In order to be there, you need to breathe in mindfully and bring your mind home to your body. Or you might like to practice walking meditation, mindful walking. Why breathing in, you make one step or two steps, and you become aware of the step you make. You are touching life in the present moment with your foot. One step alone can bring you home to the here and the now and be fully present in the here and the now. There are many uh, ways 
our practice. They can help bring our mind home to our body so that we can be established in the here and the now. When you breathe in mindfully and look at a flower like this one, you have an opportunity to get in touch with uh, this flower deeply. You are mindful that the flower is there. Mindfulness is the kind of energy that allows us to know what is there, what is happening in the here and the now. When you practice mindful breathing, the object of your mindfulness is your in-breath. Your in-breath is something that is uh, happening in the here and the now. And you like, you may enjoy your in-breath also. When you breathe in and using the energy of mindfulness generated by your in-breath, you can recognize that flower as uh, existing. And you get in touch with that flower. And if your mindfulness is strong enough, powerful enough, you are concentrated on the flower, and you get the insight that that flower is a wonder a wonder. And uh, you may see that the flower belongs to the kingdom of God or the pure land of the Buddha. And when you get in touch with the flower, you get in touch with the kingdom of God and you get in touch with God Because God is always with his kingdom. And uh, you may get insight that the kingdom of God is available in the here and the now. You don't have to go and look for it in the future or somewhere else. You don't need to die in order to go to the kingdom. In fact, you have to be very alive in order to do so. And to be alive, to be fully present in the here and the now, you need only to breathe in mindfully. And it takes two or three seconds. So the, the kingdom of God is available to you because you have the power, the capacity of being mindful. And the insight you get is the kingdom is available in the here and the now and you would like to make yourself available to the kingdom. And to make yourself available to the kingdom, that can be done very quickly. Just breathe in mindfully, or making a step mindfully. And then you practice, when you practice um, breathing in, I'm aware of my body. This is the third exercise recommended by the Buddha in the Sutra on Mindful Breathing. Breathing in, I'm aware of my body. Mindfulness of the body. You know that your body is there. And while breathing in like that, you bring your mind home to your body. And there you are, alive, present. And you might discover that your body also belongs to the kingdom of God. Your body, like that flower, is a wonder. And you can touch the kingdom of God also in your body. You don't have to go far and in the future in order to, to get in touch with the kingdom of God. 
mindfulness uh, allowed us to be alive and to touch the wonders of life inside of us and around us. And many of these wonders have the power to heal, to nourish. And you don't have to go to a temple in order to practice mindfulness. Walking from the parking lot to your office, you might enjoy the practice of mindful walking. You might like to enjoy every step. Touching the wonders of life, that is something all of us can do. Years ago, we offered a retreat for congressmen in Washington, D.C. They have a hectic life, and they need uh, the practice of mindfulness in order to release the tension, um, to, uh, to, uh, to relax and to be in touch with life. Years, many years after, after the, the retreat, uh, they continue to practice so mindful walking. And uh, several of them wrote us and said that from the office where they work, to the place where they cast the vote, they always practice mindful work and stop all thinking, just work. And uh, they say that uh, they survive that hectic life just by mindful walking. So from your from the parking lot to, you, to your office, you may like to do like that. You stop all your thinking and you uh, enjoy every step. Work in such a way that every step can bring you freedom, can bring you solidity, freedom and uh, healing. Many of us use the practice of uh, mindful walking to heal ourselves. When you breathe in mindfully and focus your attention on your breath, when you make a step mindfully and focus your attention on your step, you release the past, you release the future, you release all your projects because your mind has only one object, that is your in-breath and your, uh, or your step. One in-breath or one step can set you free, free from the worries and the uncertainty about future, worry, uh, free from the regret and the sorrow concerning the past. The past may be a prison, the future may be a prison, if you are subjected to regret, sorrow, fear, uncertainty. But when you focus your attention on your in-breath, you release everything. So one breath, one in-breath set you free. One step making mindfulness set you free. And when you are free, your body has regained its power to heal itself. And your mind also. I have said in the beginning that uh, when you love someone, you would like to offer him or her the best thing you have. The best thing, the most precious thing you have is your presence. But your presence may have a higher quality. You are fresh, you are free, you are solid, you are happy. And the practice of mindfulness help, help you to retain your freshness, to cultivate more peace, 
มอสอลิดิตี้ There is a practice uh, for children called uh, pebble meditation. There are four pebbles, and the children practice like this. The first pebble represents uh, a flower. Breathing in, I see myself as a flower. Breathing out, I feel fresh. The human being is a kind of flower. And if you don't know how to practice, and then we will lose our freshness. And we do not have much to offer the person we love. So practicing mindful breathing or walking and, re- and restore your freshness, your flowerness, is something possible. Releasing the worries, the fear, the anger, and, and restore your freshness is something that we can do. While sitting or walking, the children practice breathing in. I see myself as a flower. You don't have to imagine yourself as a flower, because the human body, the human being, is very beautiful. It is a real flower. Look at the child. Look at her face. Her tiny uh, hand. His tiny foot. It's a real flower. It's beautiful when the child sleeps. When the, it's beautiful when the child uh, is awake and play. And we are born as flowers. And it is possible for us to preserve our flowerness, our freshness, our beauty. The second pebble breathing in, I see myself as a mountain. A mountain represents stability and solidity. A person cannot be a happy person unless she has some stability. He, he has some stability. And the practice of mindful breathing, mindful sitting, mindful walking can always help us to cultivate more stability and solidity. And our solidity, our stability is something we can offer to the person we love. If you are too unstable, if you are not uh, solid, we are not happy. And we cannot, uh, and the other person suffer also because of that. So cultivating stability and solidity is something you can do. Breathing in, I see myself as uh, still water. Breathing out, I reflect things as they truly are. When you are calm, you are not victims of wrong perceptions. You are, vic- you are not victims of uh, anger and fear because you are calm enough. You don't imagine things. So breathing in, breathing out, or practicing walking, you, are, you can cultivate uh, peace, calmness, tranquility. A person who does not have enough peace in himself, herself, cannot be a happy person. So cultivating peace in oneself is something we can do with the practice of uh, mindful breathing, mindful walking, mindful sitting. And when you have peace in you, you have something to offer him or her. Breathing in, I see myself as space. Breathing out, I feel free. If you do not have enough uh, space in our heart, we have so much worries and fear and anger, we are not happy. And that is why the practice is to bring more space into our heart and around us. 
a person cannot be a happy person unless she has some freedom, some space in, in herself or around her. So to love means to offer space. And if you do not have space in you, how can you offer your beloved one with space? That is why the practice of mindfulness, whether that is mindfulness of breathing or walking, or working, or, or, or eating, always help us uh, cultivate these, uh, these values, these energies. How we can cultivate our beauty, our, um, our uh, freshness. We can cultivate more uh, our um, stability and solidity. We can cultivate more, cultivate more the energy of uh, peace, calmness, and we can always uh, cultivate more uh, the element of uh, freedom in us. So when you look at your beloved one and you say, darling, I'm here for you, that is a great gift because your presence has the element of freshness, of stability, of peace, and of freedom. The best kind of gift you can make to him or to her. That presence generated by the practice of mindfulness, of breathing or walking, that presence is for you first, for us first, and then for the other person. We have, we have to be truly present because love always begins with oneself. If you are not capable of loving yourself, of taking care of yourself, you will not have the capacity to love the other person and take good care of him or her. And that is why loving oneself is the foundation for loving the other person. And there are practices that everyone can do in order to care for oneself, in order for us to be able to care for the other person and for the world. Uh, the Buddha proposed uh, many easy, simple practices that everyone can do. Like the first um, practice of mindful breathing, exercise of mindful breathing, breathing in, I know I am breathing in. Breathing out, I know I am breathing out. You recognize your in-breath you recognize your own breath. And since you, are, you have your in-breath as the object of your mind, you release everything else. You are free. A very simple exercise. And the effect is a great. It sets you free. Just three, four seconds of breathing in. And you don't need to practice many months and many uh, years in order to see the effect. The first, the first few minutes when you begin the practice, you can see the outcome right away. Breathing in, if you pay attention only to your in-breath, and then you can release and the past and the future and all your projects. And the process of healing begins right away. The second exercise on mindful breathing is um, Breathing in, I follow my in-breath from the beginning to the end. I follow my in-breath all the way through. Your, your in-breath may last only three or four or five seconds. But while breathing in, 
you are fully concentrated on your in breath and you may enjoy breathing in because breathing in is something enjoyable too you don't have to suffer while breathing in if you suffer while breathing in you are not practice you are not practicing correctly because life is a lot of suffering already in life. Why do you have to practice in order to suffer more? <laughs> so whether it is the practice of mindful breathing or mindful walking, mindful sitting, we do it in such a way that it gives you pleasure and happiness. The practice is pleasant, should be pleasant. And when the energy of mindfulness and concentration are powerful enough, you always get an insight. The insight, that insight can help liberate you from your afflictions like fear, anger, jealousy, despair, and so on. There are three kinds of energies that can be generated by the practice of mindfulness. The first energy is uh, mindfulness, which allows us to become alive, to become present in the here and the now, and to be aware of uh, what is happening in the here and the now. And the second energy is the energy of concentration. You have, when you are very aware, when you are very mindful of something, you are naturally concentrated on, on that. If you are aware, if you are mindful, you are in-breath, you'll be concentrating on your in-breath. So that is uh, the meaning of the second exercise. Breathing in, I, am, I follow my in-breath all the way through. So mindfulness and become powerful, because of the concentration that is born from the practice of mindfulness. And when mindfulness and concentration are together, are powerful enough, you always get the third energy, the energy of insight. Insight, in this case, does not come from thinking but from mindfulness. And during the time of practicing mindfulness and concentration, you don't need to think. You might like to stop the thinking altogether. Insight has the outcome of non-thinking. When we breathe in mindfully, and with concentration, we may discover many things. We may discover the fact that we are alive. Many do not know that they are alive. They are there, but they are not alive because that they do not have mindfulness. So they, there is a very simple exercise. Breathing in, Mindfully, I feel alive. And this is the truth. If uh, someone is not alive, she cannot breathe in anymore. So breathing in mindfully, you get the insight that you are alive. And to be alive is the most wonderful thing. It is a miracle. It is the greatest of all miracles to be alive. And just two or three seconds breathing in can, can bring you that insight that you are alive and you touch the miracle of being alive. And when you breathe out, you can celebrate the fact that you are alive. So happiness is possible, joy is possible just by one in-breath and one out-breath. And it's nourishing and healing. And breathing in mindfully, mindfully like that 
help you to touch uh, many conditions of happiness that have the power to heal and to nourish in us and around us. Suppose we breathe in and we become mindful of our heart. Breathing in, I'm aware of my heart. Generating the energy of mindfulness, you use that energy of mindfulness to recognize the presence of your heart. You kind of embrace your heart with the energy of mindfulness. And you can discover the fact that your heart still functions normally. That is already an insight. And it's wonderful to have a heart that still functions normally. There are those of us who only wish for that. And their deepest desire might might be just having a heart, a normal heart like that. So breathing in and having our heart as the object of our mindfulness, we can feel grateful to our heart. And that is one of the conditions of happiness that we are having. And when the Buddha teaches uh, the practice of mindfulness of the body, he advises us to get in touch with all uh, parts of the body and smile and recognize uh, uh, um, these parts of the body. Uh, there is an exercise of uh, deep total relaxation that uh, we will try today. Uh, we put ourselves in the lying position and we begin to breathe in and out mindfully and recognize uh, part of our body. It's like a scanning our body, not with uh, X-ray, but the ray of mindfulness. You recognize uh, your eyes, breathing in, I am aware of my eyes. Breathing out, I smile to my eyes. Recognizing the presence of your eyes. And you might get the insight that, well, my eyes are still in good conditions. A paradise of forms and colors uh, is available to me just because I still have eyes in good condition. You need only to open your eyes in order to touch the paradise of form and color. That is another condition of happiness. And we go through the body and recognize every part of the body. And when we come to a place that is uh, a little bit ailing, we may like to stop longer and embrace with compassion and tenderness, that part of the body that is ailing. That practice of being aware of the body can help heal the body. You can still continue with your med- uh, with the medicine, but uh, to relax our body, to uh, to embrace tenderly that part of our, our body with mindfulness uh, practice can accelerate, can help very much the healing, can make the healing happen more quickly. The third exercise, breathing in, I'm aware of my body, is part of that exercise. And uh, the fourth exercise is uh, breathing in, I release all the tension in my body. The body has uh, the power to heal itself. Only if we allow it to do that. When an animal in the forest uh, gets wounded, deeply wounded, she knows how to, what to do. The animal finds it quiet place and lie down. She knows deeply that resting is the only way to heal. 
The animal does not think of uh, looking for food or running after an animal. She knows that, that the best thing is to rest like that because the body has a natural tendency, natural power to heal itself. We human beings, we used to have that kind, to have that kind of wisdom. But we have lost our capacity to rest. We have worked our body too hard. We have accumulated a lot of tension in our body and make it more difficult for our body to heal. We only count on medicines and other uh, kind of uh, means. So the fourth, uh, the fourth exercise of mindful breathing is very helpful. It helps us um, to be aware of our body. And our mind uh, become embodied again and help the body to release the tension. And when the tension is released, the body recover that capacity to heal itself. So the practice of uh, mindful sitting with relaxation, the practice of mindful walking, the practice of uh, uh, mindful breathing while lying down can be very helpful. It can heal. And you do not have to set aside time in order to do that. Just as I said, walking from the parking lot to the office, you have a time to practice, releasing the tension and enjoying every step and every breath and touching the kingdom of God around you and inside of you. The only thing that uh, is that there should be someone to remind you to do it. You might understand it perfectly, but you don't do it. We live as a community. Our root uh, practice center is in France, but uh, in uh, North America, we have uh, Deer Park Monastery in Southern California, Escondido. And we have um, the Blue Cliff uh, Practice Center in the state of New York. And uh, we live as uh, a four four Sangha, monks, nuns, and lay practitioners. And we practice, practice together and we remind of each other to practice. When you listen to the bell, well, hundreds of us listen to the bell together. When we sit together and walk together, we do that together. And uh, breathing together, walking together, sitting together, we generate a very uh, powerful collective energy of mindfulness, concentration, and compassion. And that helps heal us. When you find yourself in an environment filled with that kind of energy, peace, mindfulness, compassion, you get the healing very easily and quickly. I think a corporation, corporation can organize also as a practice community. There are times when you can sit together can breathe together, can walk together, release the tension together, and then uh, together we can generate that kind of uh, collective energy that is uh, very nourishing and healing. Our retreats of mindfulness uh, are always attended by uh, teenagers and uh, children. And there are practitioners who bring their babies Although the babies do not understand a Dharma talk, but uh, 
if they find themselves in an environment that is so peaceful, so compassionate, they get the nourishment. They feel it. So every, everyone can, uh, can profit from the practice. In a practice center, when you need to move from one place to another place, you always apply the techniques of mindful walking. No matter how short or how long the distance is, the practice is to arrive in the here and the now with every step, and touching the wonders of life with every step. And while we walk, we do not talk, and we do not think. When we stop our thinking, our, our talking, we touch life more deeply, so that we can get the nourishment and the healing. And when, let us enjoy breathing together. When you eat your breakfast, you have a chance to practice mindfulness of eating. You don't have to think about your projects, your work. Every moment of breakfast is an opportunity for us to, to get in touch with the wonders of life. Today, we will have a chance to share a meal together in mindfulness. Holding a piece of bread, you might like to stop your thinking and look deeply into the piece of bread. Mindfully, you breathe in, and you might get in touch with the fact that the piece of bread that you are holding contains the whole universe. There is the sunshine that uh, help uh, the wheat to grow. There is the cloud that provide rain for the wheat to grow. Uh, the earth is in there. Time, space, and everything of, of the cosmos has come together in order to help produce that piece of bread. And that insight you can get in just a few seconds of looking mindfully at the piece of bread. If you keep thinking about the past or the future or your projects, you miss the bread. You miss uh, the kingdom of God that the bread is bringing to you. And when you put uh, the piece of bread in your mouth, you might like to enjoy just chewing the bread getting in touch with the wonders of life instead of uh, showing your projects, your worries, your fear. You stop all your thinking. You just enjoy eating your breakfast. And that is a practice. You don't need to set aside time for practicing. When you take a shower, that is time to practice mindfulness. You might enjoy your mindful breathing and become aware of the water of your body. And that can, you can uh, create the joy and the happiness while taking the, the shower. The essential is to stop thinking. 
the thinking will carry you away and doesn't allow you to leave uh, that moment of, of life. René Descartes said that, uh, I think, therefore I am. I am not very sure of that. Because if you think so much, you go around with your thinking. Your thinking might not be productive at all. It carry you to many realms, and it could make you worry more, angry, angrier, and so on. So uh, if you are carried away by your thinking, you are not there. That's why I think, therefore, I am not there. <laughs> it's better to stop the thinking in order to be there. When we brush our teeth, <laughs> we may choose to, to brush our teeth in such a way that make freedom and joy and happiness possible during the time of brushing our teeth. It may take mm, two minutes or three minutes. And the essential is to stop your thinking, even if you have a lot of things to do. Stop your thinking and uh, enjoy brushing your teeth. When I brush my teeth, I usually touch the fact that I am over 80 and I still have some teeth to brush. <laughs> and that is enough to make me happy. <laughs> brush your teeth in such a way that freedom is possible joy and happiness be possible during the time of toothbrush. That is a challenge. And I know you can do it. Do not think about your work, your projects. Just enjoy being there and brush your teeth. That moment, you can leave it deeply also. because uh, you can always touch the wonders of life, the kingdom of God, in the here and the now. We used to distinguish between uh, time for work and free time. Let us change our way of uh, of thinking. Suppose you have uh, free time, some free time, and if you do not know how, not know how to make use of your free time, your time is not truly free. If you could keep thinking and worrying, that time does not uh, make you happy. That time is not for working, of course, but you continue to think about it. You continue to worry about it. And that thinking is not productive. It's uh, very important to learn how to, uh, how to release and to be fully in the moment. <coughs> and uh, watering the vegetable garden, in the backyard, you may like to, to be fully present with that. Uh, cooking breakfast. You might like to make uh, breakfast cooking into a session of meditation. You can enjoy every, every minute of uh, breakfast making. You don't try to, f to do it quickly in order to have breakfast. Or doing the dishes. You can enjoy deeply every second of doing dishes. You don't have to try to finish 
quickly in order to do other things. We have the tendency to rush, to finish quickly with uh, what we are doing. It has become a habit. And with mindfulness of breathing, you can recognize that habit and it helps you to stop being carried away by that kind of um, attitude. Suppose you are washing dishes and you want to finish in order to sit down and enjoy a cup of tea. (laughs) With the practice of mindfulness, you can make the time of dishwashing a beautiful time also, a joyful time when you are fully alive. And if you are not capable of doing so, when you finish washing dishes and sit down and hold the cup of tea, you will think of other things. You will not be able to enjoy your tea. You are always carried away. You are not capable of living your life in the present moment. And mindfulness helps us to live deeply every moment of our daily life. And we need some training in order to do so. And if you have a chance to live with a community of practice, and then we get that habit of living uh, deeply each moment of our daily life. In uh, Buddhist meditation, we know that uh, insight is the kind, is the factor that can help us uh, uh, transform afflictions like anger, fear, despair. Insight is the kind of energy that can liberate us. And we know that uh, insight is not the outcome of thinking. We have the thinking mind. But our consciousness is more than the thinking mind. In Buddhism, we speak of store consciousness. And that is a that is something much much bigger than our thinking mind. Imagine an iceberg in the ocean. The part that we see above the water is very small, but the part uh, in the water is huge. Store consciousness is like that. Our mind consciousness is very small. In neuroscience, uh, people like to speak of that part of consciousness as uh, background consciousness. Sometimes we call it root consciousness. Mula Vishnana. Uh, sometimes we call it uh, appropriating consciousness. Sometimes we call it the uh, store consciousness. That part of consciousness is always with the body. It has the capacity to, to receive uh, information. It has the capacity to process information. And it has the capacity to, to, uh, to preserve, to conserve, uh, preserve the information. And uh, mind consciousness is uh, the upper level of consciousness. Mind consciousness sometimes can stop operating, like in the case um, uh, uh, you sleep without dream, your mind consciousness stop completely. If you do not have dream in your sleep, there is a, a kind of meditation concentration called uh, no perception uh, meditation. And when the practitioner go into that meditation, his mind consciousness stop uh, operating also. 
And we talk about realm of life where there is no mind consciousness, there is only store consciousness. Suppose we look at a tree, we know that some, somehow there is consciousness in the tree. Because the tree knows how to gather information, to process information, to get the nourishment, to react, to survive. Consciousness is in the tree. But the tree the, does not seem to have uh, 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 doing a lot of, uh, of thinking. There is a Vietnamese poet who said that, well, next life I would like to be a pine tree so that I don't have to think. To think make me suffer too much. In the Zen tradition, mind consciousness is the, the gardener. And store consciousness is the land, is the, it is the garden. The gardener can prepare the land, plant the seed, water the, the seed. But it is store consciousness, it's the, the land that can produce the, the flower and the fruit of uh, enlightenment. So practicing meditation, we don't count on mind consciousness alone. We count mostly on store consciousness. Mind consciousness has to play the role of the gardener. It has to work the land and plant the seed well and cover up and water. That's all. The insight, the discovery, what we find out is not the work of mind consciousness. It is the work of, uh, of store. And many uh, scientific discoveries have been done in that. Not by the thinking, the thinking mind, but by the unconscious, unconscious mind. So it is possible for us to, to entrust the task to our deeper consciousness. We have to pose the question to ask the question correctly. In Zen Buddhism, we call it uh, koan. Suppose uh, the teacher gives you the koan, uh, everything come home to the one, where the one uh, uh, will go, have to go. Uh, um, what is the sound of uh, one hand? All these are devices. It's kind of um, question that we entrust to store consciousness. The important thing is to, to, to ask the right question very clearly and to entrust the question to store consciousness. And after having done, done, done that, the garden, gardener may like to, uh, to do other things. There is a Buddhist scholar in America. One time I told, I told him that uh, I enjoy gardening. I enjoy um, planting lettuce uh, and things like that. And I say that when the lettuce does not do well, does not grow well, you don't blame uh, the lettuce. Uh, the, the lettuce but 
but uh, you you feel that your if the if the lettuce grow well or not well is the gardener who is responsible. And he said, Thay, you should not spend your time growing lettuces because you can use your time to write um, poems because he liked my poetry. I told him, dear friend, if I do not grow lettuce, I cannot write these poems. It's because I am capable of growing uh, lettuce, that is why I can produce a poem like that. So, washing your dishes, enjoying washing dishes, stop the thinking, and get the pleasure in washing the dishes, is a way to support uh, store consciousness to bring about the insight. Brushing your teeth mindfully and enjoy brushing your teeth. Do not think about uh, your project. Do not try to find the solution with your thinking mind. And that is the practice. Non-thinking is the secret of the success. And that is why the time when we are not working, that time can be very productive if we know how to focus on the moment and enjoy every moment of our daily life. And if we know how to do that, we will not be victim of stress, anxiety, depression, and so on. That is one aspect of the problem. The other aspect of the problem is that the time call work time, we can handle it in such a way that we can enjoy, that it can bring us pleasure. There is a way not to be under pressure. There is a way in order to enjoy really what you are doing as work. We, in Plum Village, we do a lot of things. We want to succeed in, our, uh, in, our, uh, in what we, we do. We offer many retreats of mindfulness everywhere, in many countries, Europe, Asia, America, Australia. We organize uh, days of mindfulness, sessions of practice. We organize uh, retreats for uh, health professionals, uh, school teachers, uh, uh, young people, and so on. We, can, we want to succeed in our, in our work also. But we learn how to do the work in such a way that uh, we will not be victim of, uh, of uh, pressure and stress. Many monks and nuns who are excellent Dharma teachers, they enjoy cooking, they enjoy cleaning, they enjoy gardening, and they consider these things as important as uh, the, other, the other kind of work. We learn how to enjoy rearranging the cushions in the meditation hall. We enjoy growing uh, vegetables. And everything we do, we put all our heart and mind in it, and we try to, to do it in such a way that freedom and joy and brotherhood and sisterhood become possible. There are times when we sit together in a meeting, but we don't talk about um, work. We have a weekly meeting called Meeting of Happiness. And in the meeting, you just remind each other that you have so many conditions of happiness available. And it may take two hours, three hours, just with one cup of tea, 
and we nourish each other with the practice of mindfulness. We remind each other we are, that we are very lucky people, that we have so many conditions of happiness available right in the here and the now. We don't need to go and uh, look for more conditions of happiness. And that's very nourishing. And I think that in a corporation, this is possible also. And many of uh, the practice in a, a practice center can be, can be used in the life of a corporation. Every time you organize um, a retreat, six days or seven days, we see many people transform. The practice uh, is simple enough for everyone to, to do. The practice of mindful breathing, mindful sitting and walking, releasing the tension in the body. Everyone can do. And when you are able to reduce the tension in your body, uh, to release the tension in your body, you also can reduce the amount of pain in your body, including chronic pain. Because the pain and tension, they go together. If you can release uh, tension, you can reduce the pain. And the basic practice of mindful breathing to be aware of your body and to release the tension in your body, you can do it uh, several times a day. Many of our brothers and sisters program a bell of mindfulness in the computer. And every 15 minutes, the bell reminds us to stop and to enjoy breathing in and breathing out. The bell of mindfulness. The practice help us to touch the conditions of happiness in the here and the now so that we can generate a feeling of joy at any moment we want. And that is not too difficult. If you go back to your body, to, uh, if you bring your mind home to your body, and uh, establish yourself in the here and the now, you will realize that conditions for your happiness are more than enough. And happiness is possible right in the here and the now. So to generate a moment of joy is possible. To generate a moment of happiness is also possible for a practitioner, no matter where and when. And the practice of mindfulness on, also help us to recognize a painful feeling, a painful emotion when they manifest. A painful uh, feeling, we try, we have the tendency to try to run away from it. We want to cover it up by consumption. If we uh, listen to music, if, if we uh, read magazines, if we uh, eat, maybe it's not because uh, these things are very, uh, uh, bring us a lot of happiness, but because we don't want to get in touch with the suffering. We want to cover it, cover it up with uh, consumptions. Obesity, is the outcome of that. 
you have uh, the feeling of uh, loneliness, despair, anger, uh, worries in you, and you don't know how to handle. And that's why you want to forget to run away. And one of the ways is to just consume some music, magazines, food, are there in order to help you to cover up your suffering. You do not solve the problem. But the practice consists in going home and take good care of that pain. Breathing in, I'm aware of the painful feeling in me. There is the energy of pain, of course. But as a practitioner, you generate the energy of mindfulness and concentration. And with the second energy, you recognize the first energy. Hello there, my little pain. I know you are there. I will take good care of you. So like a mother holding her baby when the baby suffers, the practitioner generates the energy of mindfulness and concentration and go home and take care of the painful feeling or the painful uh, emotion in him or in her and get a relief. So many young people who are not capable of handling a strong emotion. And they believe that the only way to, air, to, to stop suffering is to go and kill themselves. That is why so many young people commit suicide everywhere. But we know very well that an emotion, whether it is strong, how, how However strong it is, it is only an emotion, and we are much more than emo- an emotion. We don't have to an emotion that is something that come and stay for some time, and finally we we'll have to go away. Why do we have to die because of just one emotion? That is what you can remind yourself when an emotion manifests in you. And if you know the practice of mindful breathing, mindful walking, generating the energy of mindfulness, you can very well recognize and embrace that emotion. And you are safe. And emotion is like a a storm coming. And there are ways in order to stand and not to allow the, the storm to blow you away. The practice of deep breathing in a position of sit, sitting or lying down. Focus your attention on the rise and fall of your abdomen. And just that, stop all the thinking. Because the more you think the emotion, the, the stronger the emotion can become. Stopping the, the, the thinking. Bring your mind down to the level of uh, the navel and breathe in deeply and become aware of the rise and fall of your abdomen and stay in that position and continue and your emotion could not do any, not be able to do anything to you. And after five minutes, ten minutes or even half an hour, the emotion will go and you will survive it. And next time you and you say that next time when it comes, you do just that. It's easy enough. We should train ourselves only a few times. And every day, if we know how to, to do it for a few minutes, and then after a few weeks, become, it will become a habit. And when the emotion manifests, you will remember to practice. And you are no longer afraid of an emotion. So when the baby suffers, the mother should be there in order to pick up the baby and hold the baby tenderly. The mother does not know what is the cause of the suffering of the baby, but the fact that she is holding the baby tenderly can already make the baby suffer less. Because the energy of tenderness begins to penetrate into the baby that brings a relief. 
And after having hold the child for, for a few minutes, the mother might find out what is wrong with the baby, and she can change the situation easily. The same is true with the practitioner. In the beginning, she does not know what is the root of that pain, that emotion. But the fact that she is able to hold it tenderly without uh, 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 being, uh, um, using, uh, with try, attempt to run away can already bring a relief. And with uh, a little more of concentration and uh, mindfulness, we can discover the nature, the roots of our emotion, and uh, that will help uh, uh, transform the emotion and the pain. And if uh, adult father, mother, school teachers know how to do that, they will teach uh, the young people how to do it. It's easy enough to learn. And therefore, a practitioner of mindfulness is capable of releasing the tension in her body, reduce the pain in his body, generate a feeling of joy whenever he wants, generate a feeling of happiness whenever she wants, uh, recognize and embrace a painful feeling, uh, recognize and embrace a painful emotion. All these things can be learned. And we hope that in the future, our, uh, uh, this kind of practice can be taught in school at every level. We are trying uh, to do that. We have uh, met with uh, school teachers in many countries, and they all agree that this is uh, something they must uh, learn and bring into the classroom and help uh, the young people. The miracle of uh, transformation and healing always happen in our retreats. Uh, during this uh, American, uh, North American tour, we have uh, offered a retreat in Vancouver for 800 uh, people. After that, uh, another retreat for nine, more than 900 in, uh, in Colorado. And we just finished one in uh, Southern California, Escondido, for uh, 700 people. And the miracle of uh, transformation and healing always happened. And using the practice of uh, compassionate listening and gentle speech, many people are able, are capable of uh, restoring communication and uh, reconcile. And there are those of us who can use uh, our mobile phone to practice listening with compassion and using loving speech in order to reconcile with those who are at home who are not in the retreat. And we have been offering so many retreats like that in the world and seeing that the effect, the, 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 the result, the fruit of the practice, uh, we are encouraged in this practice. That is why, as the monks and nuns and lay practitioners, we want to continue, we want, because uh, that brings us a lot of happiness. And we want to share the practice and to help many people to suffer less. And that is why we are kind of, uh, we, are, we want also success. 
but our success, our, our, our willingness to succeed does, does not remove us from the present moment. Our practice is to, is to be ground always in the present moment. We know that uh, the future is made only of one element, that is the present moment. And if uh, we take care of the present moment the best way we can, it means that we have done everything we can do for the future. And that is uh, our practice, uh, to be there in the here and the now and do our best with that. And do not let us, and do not let the worries, uh, uh, the projects uh, uh, carry us uh, away. I think uh, many uh, are successful in their, in their career, but many have become victims of their own success. They are not happy. Happiness is not uh, the aim of uh, when we do something we want uh, to succeed. But uh, is that worthwhile to continue if, uh, if the, that success does not bring happiness? And many have become victims of their own success. And uh, although they succeed in their enterprise, their, but uh, Happiness is not there. They have no time to love, to live their life. They have no time for themselves. They have no time for their beloved one. I know a successful businessman in Germany. His name is Fred, Fred, Frederick. He's uh, only 40. He's a very successful businessman, but his wife, uh, Laura, suffered very deeply because of loneliness, because Frederick did not have the time, even for himself and for, for her and for their son. She tried to suffer less by um, doing uh, human, humanitarian work. She tried to forget her loneliness by um, uh, going to school and get another uh, degree, but that did not help. And she cried during the night. And he said that, darling, no one can replace me now. I have to wait uh, three, four years before I can find someone to replace me, and then we will have more time for ourselves and for our son. For the moment, no one can replace me. And that, uh, that promise was never been fulfilled because uh, six months later, he got killed in an accident, car accident. He was so busy that when his wife uh, was hospitalized, he could not have the time to go to the hospital. And even when his uh, son, Philip, was hospitalized, he could not go to the hospital because uh, his time, his energy is sucked by the will to succeed. And you know what happened? Only three days after his death, they, re they found someone to replace him.
and Frederick is still alive in uh, there are many Frederick are among us and many Laura are among us we have to wake up from that we have to learn how to uh, change our way of life in order to be to uh, to be truly alive and the practice of mindfulness help us uh, bring real uh, love real happiness to our life that Four, there are four uh, elements of true love that happiness, uh, that mindfulness can help uh, generate. The first element of true love is um, love and kindness, my tree. That is uh, the capacity to make another person happy. And we have already learned that uh, if we cannot make ourselves uh, peaceful, fresh, and happy, we cannot make another person happy. The, the practice of mindfulness help restore solidity, freedom, peace, and freshness to us, so that we can we have we have the capacity to make the other person happy. The second element of true love is uh, compassion. Karuna, that capacity of uh, understanding the suffering and help remove it. If you love someone, you should understand the suffering in him or in her, and you should be able to help uh, transform that and remove that. And that you can do only after you have done it for you. You have fear, anger, despair in you, and if you don't know how to transform it, how can you help your beloved one to do the same? So understanding the suffering inside and bring a relief and transformation is very crucial for love. And then you'll be able to help your beloved one uh, uh, transform the suffering. So that is the second element of true love the capacity to help someone suffer less. And the third element of true love is a joy, is joy. Because true love always uh, generates joy for you and for the other person. It, if uh, both of us cry during the process of loving, that's not true love. True love should bring joy every moment of our daily life. And mindfulness can help doing that. And the fourth element is, um, of true love is uh, inclusiveness. In true love, there is no longer any frontier between you and your beloved one. Your suffering is his suffering. His happiness is your happiness. And there is a perfect uh, mutual understanding between two of you. And together you can serve and help uh, many people. True love is the kind of love that always grows. It has no frontier. And practicing true love you begin to embrace everyone, the whole planet, and bring a lot of joy to you. And that is why we have to know where we go. If love is our destination, and then we have to sacrifice other things that are not love, like fame, wealth, sensual pleasure, power, because there are those who are, have plenty of these things and who suffer very deeply. And uh, 
when my when I was ordained as a monk at the, at the age of 16, my 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 teacher gave me the name the Dharma name uh, Nyakhan, which means one action. You do only one thing. You don't do many things at the same time. Monotasking. <laughs> and I try to to live according to this uh, this teaching. I want to transform myself. I want to help people happy. Because I know that if people are happy, I can be happy also. And that is why Buddhist concentration, Buddhist meditation is made of two, of, of two elements. The first element is uh, concentration. You focus your attention just, one, just on one thing. Otherwise, your concentration is not powerful enough to get a breakthrough and to get insight. And concentration can be practiced not by thinking, but by brushing your teeth in mindfulness, washing your dishes in mindfulness, watering the vegetable in mindfulness, Enjoying every step. That will make this concentration more and more powerful. And your store consciousness will bring you offer the insight that you need. And that is why the first, uh, the first element of Buddhist meditation is uh, samadhi concentration. And the second is uh, vipassana, means uh, looking deeply, looking deeply. You concentrate on just one thing, and you only look deeply into that one thing. And that is the technique, as the secret of uh, bringing up insight. I think uh, concerning information, we know that uh, we have the feeling that we are overwhelmed by information. We don't need that much information. We just need a few. And there are basic information that uh, we should, uh, we should uh, maintain alive. Because there are many things we know, but we never put into practice. So your happiness does not depend on how much information you have, but how, what kind of information that you have, and how you put into practice that kind of information. And the basic information is that uh, we are alive. Breathing in, I know I am alive. And breathing out, I can touch all wonders of life in me and around me in this moment. And that can cultivate my happiness that can make me an instrument of love, and I can help, I can love. Well, let us have the rest of our time for a few questions. Thank you. Brother Spirit and Brother Stream, where 
who say something about the uh, wake up, right? After. Uh, there is a microphone somewhere. Hi. Oh, it works. Thank you for being fully present here for us. Uh, I have a question about uh, mindful walking. Uh, I'm pregnant, so when I'm walking, my hip really hurts and my knees, they all hurt. So if I do mindful walking, does that mean I focus on my painful, painful knees and the painful hips and the, shouldn't I just think about something else and get distracted? <laughs> Yeah. Um, you may join us uh, sitting on a chair, and someone can push you, and you can you can uh, profit <laughs> from the collective energy of peace and joy. Uh, and 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 you do uh, walking meditation uh, with your feet later, but now you can sit on a chair and let someone uh, uh, push you. This is possible, yeah. Oh, so this is not the right time for me to do mindful walking. <laughs> I think at least um, you, you can enjoy a few steps. You can always en enjoy a few steps. But when it becomes uh, difficult, tiring, you can stop. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yes. There are practitioners of meditation who, uh, who, who could not walk, and, uh, but they like to join us during work invitation. They bring along their uh, armchair and they uh, go wheelchair, and uh, they enjoy uh, the Sangha and the collective energy of the, generated by the practice. Hello? Oh, this, this one works here. Um, so, uh, my name is Alex Aris. Um, I'm, I'm working at Google. And so, my question is not necessarily my question, but it could be maybe a typical Googler, but I think this is very relevant. So, you said if you practice mindfulness, this is good, but I'm thinking how we can apply this in Google. So I think a typical Googler would think about, well, you know, you know, if I practice mindfulness, then I think I'm gonna lose a lot of time. Because you mentioned, you know, do your breakfast with mindfulness. So don't think about the projects and get the chance to, to get in touch with your life. Don't multitask. Don't eat quickly. <laughs> so don't do a task while eating, but there are many people who use their laptops while eating. So, um, and then um, they would be concerned, what, what am I going to do that I'm going to be losing a lot of this time? And even if they are not concerned that they will be losing the time, they will be concerned that other people will think that they'll, they are spending too much time. <laughs> Uh, eating breakfast or doing other things and not thinking about their projects. And so what will my team think about me? What will the performance review will be <laughs> about me? So um, will they say like they didn't, he didn't spend enough time and so on. So how do you, um, you know, reply to, this, to these concerns thinking if we would apply this in Google? Mm -hmm. I have said that uh, usually our thinking may be, uh, may be not very productive. Our thinking is sometimes very productive, but not always productive. And our thinking may lead us away. That's one thing I said. And uh, thinking is not the only way to, to, to succeed in finding out what you want to find out. The second thing I said is that uh, while you are brushing your teeth mindfully and uh, eating your, your breakfast mindfully, although you do not think about it, but your store consciousness continue to work on it. 
you have to rely on your store consciousness. If uh, one day you can invent something, that's the work of my uh, of uh, store consciousness. And many scientists, famous scientists, have reported that the insight came when they do not think, when they did not think. Thank you. Uh, Thai. Uh, yeah. My name is Ming. I, I don't do anything, and I hope to do even less in, when I grow up. <laughs> uh, my question for you. So, so from, for me, you are a, a, a symbol of perfection as a practitioner, in, in my opinion. And that I find that very inspiring. Uh, but ironically, I find most inspiring when you are not perfect. And, and the example of that is I read in your book somewhere that there was a moment where you got angry at somebody. And then you say you got almost so angry, you almost want to stand up and hit the guy. But you didn't, right? Because you are like a symbol of peace. And, <laughs> and, so on, right? <laughs> and, and I actually found that very inspiring because to me, it's like even Thich Nhat Hanh has anger. Right? And, and so my, my question for you is, I want to ask you to talk a little bit about your imperfection and hopefully your imperfection will inspire all of us. Mm. This, uh, this is a very important uh, question. The problem of uh, happiness and uh, suffering, the problem of perfection and non-perfection is the same. When I, spoke, uh, when I speak about the kingdom of God, I say that uh, the kingdom of God is not a place where there is no suffering to me. Because many people believe that the kingdom of God should be a place where there is no suffering. But according to this uh, teaching and practice, if uh, there is no suffering, there will be no happiness. It's like when you grow lotus flower, you need the mud. If there is no mud, there is no uh, lotus. So happiness is made of, uh, we all know that uh, happiness, when you are happy, it means that you have uh, understanding and love and compassion. Without understanding and compassion, you cannot be a happy person. And understanding and compassion arise only out of suffering. When you begin to see the suffering in someone, and when you see that uh, that person is helpless, he does not know how to handle the suffering inside of him, he suffer, he is victim of his suffering, and he make people around him suffer, including you. The, big, the, the moment when you begin to see that truth and understand the suffering in that person, compassion arises in you. Understanding bring about love and compassion. And when you have uh, compassion, you don't want to punish him anymore. Before that, you suffer, you are angry. But now, because you have seen the suffering, you have understood the suffering, you are motivated by the desire to help him to, to suffer less. It means that uh, you have uh, made use of uh, the suffering in order to uh, to create uh, understanding and compassion. We know that uh, without understanding and compassion, no happiness is possible. And that is why um, uh, we know also that in the kingdom of God, there is suffering. Where there is no suffering, no mud, there is no lotus flower. There is, where there is no suffering, there will be no understanding and compassion. 
So my definition of the kingdom of God is the place where people know how to make good use of suffering in order to create understanding and compassion. It's like uh, he know how to, good, to make good use of the mud in order to produce beautiful lotus flowers. So happiness and suffering, they lean on each other to manifest. Uh, ang- anger, anger is a kind of mud. Uh, despair is a, a kind of mud. And if you allow that, that mud to overwhelm you, well, you suffer. But if you know the practice, and then you can make good use of anger and despair in order to create uh, peace and happiness. As an organic gardener, you know how to make use, good use of the garbage. You can uh, create uh, compost from the garbage in, a nourish to, in order to nourish flowers and vegetables. The same thing is true with, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, suffering and happiness. Um, thanks to the fact that you have uh, you 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 have a suffer, that you have ingredients in order to make happiness. Looking, embracing, looking deeply at that uh, suffering, embracing deeply that suffering, understanding arise, and you can you can create. Uh, 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 joy and happiness. That is why um, that is why uh, suffering play a role in the making of happiness. Uh, what is uh, wrong with the practice is that uh, when suffering is there, and if you don't don't know how to handle suffering, that is wrong. But it's not wrong to have suffering. To have suffering, and if you know how to make good use of the suffering uh, in order to create happiness, that is something good. So we have to distinguish between um, uh, 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 good practice and bad, bad practice. If uh, it is uh, normal that a human being has uh, craving, has uh, anger, has frustration, uh, worries. But if that human being knows the practice of mindfulness, he or she will be able to make good use of that and transform it into something else like peace and understanding. So, uh, so without suffering, without uh, having anger and um, sadness uh, and despair, how could you, how could you create peace, happiness, and non-fear. So uh, it's like the left and the right. If uh, the left is not there, the right cannot be there. And if uh, politically you are on the left, you should not try to make the right disappear. Because if the right disappear, you disappear at the same time. So we should have that, that, uh, that non-dualistic way of looking at things. It is because you have anger, you have despair, you have suffering, that you have a chance to transform them into something better, peace, happiness, and love. Hi. Hello. Thanks for being here. Um, I, as a person who's struggled with depression in the past, I'm wondering if you have anything in particular to say um, about mental illnesses and, and how mindfulness can, can play a role in uh, helping people who struggle with that. Thanks. Mental illness is like a other kind of illness. Uh, it, they have their roots. Suppose we speak of a depression. Depression depression does not come by itself alone. If we look deeply into the depression, we see the roots of the depression. 
the Buddha said that uh, nothing can survive without food. Your love, no matter how beautiful your love is, and if you don't know how to nourish your love, to feed your love, it will turn to be something else later on, like hate and anger. So love needs uh, food. Suffering also, your depression also needs food in order to, to be alive. We have lived in such a way, we have consumed in such a way that make de- depression possible in the present moment. The way, uh, the way we live our daily life in the last six months, for instance, the kind of nutriment we have got, like fear, anger, despair, and we do not know how to handle these. We have allowed them to be accumulated for a long time. That is why the depression has become a reality. The Buddha said that uh, what has come to be there, if you know how to look deeply and to identify the source of uh, food, the source of nutriment that has brought it in, after you have seen the, the, the roots and the source of nutriment of what has uh, uh, come to be, you already begin uh, on your path of uh, transformation and healing. Because if you know uh, how to identify the kind of nutriment ha- that have uh, led your, have brought uh, your depression, you know how to cut the n- that source of n- nutrients. And if you, if you stop consuming that kind of nutrient, you deprive your depression of food, and your depression will have to, to die uh, in a few weeks or in a few months. So that is why the uh, learning the art of mindful living, we will not continue to ingest the kind of food that we have. Uh, the Buddha spoke about four kinds of nutrients, edible food, uh, uh, sense impressions, the kind of uh, food that you consume not by the mouth, but by eyes, ear, and uh, mind. There are many toxic things that we consume in, in our daily life. And the third kind of food is uh, volition. Uh, your, your deepest desire, your deepest intention is the food. And also the fourth kind of nutriment, which is uh, collective consciousness. If you live in a place where there is a collective energy of fear, anger, craving, hate, uh, you consume. That is why refraining from consuming uh, uh, nutrients that are toxic, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you deprive your depression of food, and your depression will have to die uh, uh, in a few weeks. And that is why all mental, um, mental illness are like that also. We have allowed ourselves to be in the toxic environment. We have allowed ourselves to consume items that, that contain craving, anger, fear, despair. And that is why um, these symptoms of, my, of, of, uh, of mental illness have appeared. And the way we deal with our sickness, we try to suppress them. When the, when, the, when the suffering come up, we, do not, we do not allow them to come up. We try to suppress them by the way of consuming. We want to cover them up. And we create a situation of bad circulation in our consciousness. And that is why mental, uh, symptoms of my mental illness begin to, de- to appear. But if you know how to practice mindfulness, You allow the pain to come up, and you embrace tenderly your pain and recognize it and look into into it. 
and then your pain will will be uh, will be embraced by that energy of mindfulness and concentration and uh, compassion, and will go down, losing some strength. And next time when it comes up, you allow it to come up because you know how to handle it, handling the pain. And after a few weeks of practicing like that, um, you create, you restore a state of good circulation in your consciousness. And the symptoms of mental illness will begin to, to, to disappear. And that is why the, the practice of mindfulness can be very healing, uh, physically and also mentally. Thank you so much for coming and reminding us how easy it can be to be happy and peaceful and loving. Um, my question follows on something that you said early on um, regarding meditation as a combination of mindfulness, concentration, and then insight that arises. Um, my question is about the insight. Having achieved an insight through meditation, does one expend effort to act on that insight, or does one simply hold the insight in mind and allow this natural circulation that you speak of to transform the mind? Insight uh, can be maintained and nourished. Like, um, insight can be can come uh, just in the present moment, like uh, in, the, in the exercise uh, of uh, mindful breathing, breathing in, I, I feel alive. So you touch the inside that uh, you are alive, and to be alive is uh, a miracle. And that is why when you breathe out, you can enjoy, you can be happy, you can celebrate the fact that you are alive. But the, cons the practice of concentration can keep the insight alive. And if the insight is alive, happiness continues to be. If you allow the insight to go, to, to go away, your happiness may go away also. It's like um, the insight of interbeing. A father looking deeply into his son, see that uh, he is uh, fully present in every cell of his son. And if the son look into himself, he can see that uh, in every cell of his body, his father is fully present. And uh, he got the insight of uh, father and son into R. You cannot remove father from son. You cannot remove son from father. That is the insight of interbeing. And when the insight of interbeing between son and father is alive, uh, anger is impossible. Because you get, when you get angry at your father, you get an angry at yourself. You are a continuation of your father. If there is a young man who say that, uh, I hate my father. I don't want to uh, have anything to do with that person. It means that that young man does not have the insight of interbeing. He does not know that his father is in him. And it is impossible to remove his father from him. If uh, he's removed the father from him, he is no longer there. And uh, if that insight is in him, uh, he knows that uh, he has to reconcile with his father in him. Because uh, to say that I do not have, I do not want to have anything to do with that person is nonsense. Because 
you are his continuation. You are him. How can you say that uh, you do not have anything to do with him? Uh, to say that means you do not have the insight of interbeing. And the insight of interbeing not only liberates you from suffering, but uh, it shows you the way to behave uh, in order for harmony, for love, for happiness to be possible. Hello. Thank you very much for your tender and conscious uh, comments. Um, one of the things, one of my passions is working with children. And I had the opportunity to be in India last year working with small children. And I was amazed at how, uh, no matter what they've been through, um, they had this joy and this compassion and this feeling of connection with community, uh, even to the point where they would write on our hands, when the world gives you a thousand reasons to cry, show the world you have a million reasons to smile. I found it so beautiful. Um, one of the things I do is work with children um, in yoga, in visualization, in creative play. And I find children in our community are already starting to multitask and looking at the digital you know, community and um, getting very fragmented in minds. And one thing I find that works very, very well is teaching through stories. And I was wondering if you had a sweet story that we may be able to share, even with our own children, helping to illustrate the power of mindfulness or joy, compassion, maybe one of your favorites. When I was small, I saw the drawing of a Buddha on the cover of a Buddhist magazine. The Buddha was sitting on the grass, very peaceful, very uh, happy. And I wish I can be some, someone like him, because around me people are nervous, uh, unhappy. So the first time when my school organized a uh, outing, climbing the, a mountain. Uh, uh, I was very excited because we learned that there was a hermit practicing on the mountain in order to become a Buddha. I, have not, I had not seen a hermit before, so I was very enthusiastic uh, climbing. And we were organized in groups of five boys and uh, five girls. And many hundreds of us uh, were climbing the mountain. We did not know how to practice walking meditation. We tried to climb quick, as quickly as possible. And half the way, we drank all our water. We were very th thirsty when we come up to the, to the top of the mountain. And the worst thing is that I learned that the, the hermit was not there. <laughs> Perhaps he had heard that 500 uh, <laughs> children are coming. <laughs> it's not quite enough for him, so he maybe he had uh, hidden himself uh, somewhere in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the mountain. So when we were given the order to uh, display our picnic and eat, I alone ventured into the wood, hoping that I can see uh, the hermit, and I hear the sound of water dripping, and I follow, and I discover a very beautiful natural well. The water was very limpid, and you know that I was very thirsty. So I'm so happy, I, I knelt down and cup the water and drink. And suddenly, a, a thought came to me. I believe that the hermit has transformed himself into a well. 
so that I can have uh, a private audience with him. And when you are small and when you have read many fairy tales, <laughs> you believe things like that. And uh, after I have drunk the water, I feel so peaceful, so happy, so fulfilled that the need that I didn't feel any desire at all. Even the desire to meet uh, the hermit as a person. And as I was very tired, I lie down and I fall into, I fell into a very deep sleep. I did not know how many minutes I slept, but when I woke up, I did not know where I was. It took time to remember that the other boys were waiting for me. I left the place with a lot of regret. And uh, I had to leave uh, my beloved well and to go down. And in my mind, there is a sentence coming, coming up. I have drunk the most delicious water in the world. Uh, and when I were back with the other children, I did not have the intention to tell them the story that I have met uh, uh, the hermit in the form of, uh, of a well. Uh, it, it's, it sounds like if I tell them, well, I will lose something. Uh, my experience, uh, kind of deep uh, uh, spiritual experience, I wanted to keep uh, by, my, by myself, to keep it long. And uh, later on, uh, when I grew up, I had the hope that everyone I meet will have a chance to meet his hermit also uh, in their lifetime, their lifetime. Maybe you have met your hermit, but you have not recognized him. Your hermit might not be a well, but might be a rock, or a tree, or a child, or a mountain. But once you have got the hermit, you know where to go, and you begin your spiritual life that can help you to overcome difficulties and find peace. And that is uh, one of the stories I like to tell children who come to Plum Village and to practice. Thank you very much. I, I'm, we're really enjoying this conversation, but I'm afraid we're running very late and we can't walk in the dark. I don't, as enlightened as we are, I, I'm, I don't think we can walk in the dark. So thank you very much. I believe right now uh, we will compress, sorry, Thai, a few things. Um, so mon monastics want to talk to us about one of your initiatives and uh, the Wake Up uh, initiative. And I invite you to do that. And then we, uh, we hear you have some gifts for us. We have some gifts for you. And, and then maybe a five minute break. Please gather back here for uh, instructions from Thai on the walking meditation. All right, uh, five minutes. So, and meanwhile, we will hear about the Wake Up Initiative. Thank you. Dear friends, thank you for your patience and uh, thank you for your enthusiasm and your smiles. It's really wonderful to sit and look at a sea of uh, glowing faces. And I think we all feel very at home here. Uh, so we wanted to share with you a little bit about um, something that came about about three years ago. Our teacher asked us to uh, find ways to share the practice with young people knowing that uh, the younger the, you are, the more receptive you are, the more flexible your mind is, um, the more quickly you can adapt and, uh, and learn good, positive habits. Um, so uh, we didn't do anything. <laughs> and then uh, uh, a few uh, weeks later, our teacher reminded us, you should really find a way to share the practice with young people. And we still didn't do anything. 
Um, so then uh, eventually uh, our teacher, I think, uh, he just saw that we, <laughs> we weren't going to uh, come up with anything. So one, one day during the summer retreat, there were a thousand, maybe a thousand people in Plum Village. I went uh, back to my bedroom in the monastic residence and I found on my bed a piece of paper uh, with a handwritten text and a little note on the corner saying, uh, please add more concrete things, Thai. <laughs> and uh, so Thai, out of his compassion, had written for us the uh, sort of mission statement, as it were, of this uh, movement for young people. And he asked us to edit, and we, we came up with a name, that, which is Wake Up. And, um, and Thai was happy with that and with the name. And so the next day, after the, uh, the Dharma talk, he, uh, he asked a few of us to, to come up, and uh, he just put a microphone in our hand, and he said, tell them about the Wake Up movement. Uh, so we had to say something about, you know, self-organizing uh, uh, movement, uh, which didn't exist yet, but uh, was uh, basically by talking about it, we made it exist. And then we thought, we thought our troubles were over, so we gave him the microphone back, and then he said, tell them about the website. <laughs> <laughs> what website? <laughs> there was no website, but pretty soon there had to be a website. Uh, so you can visit that if you like. Um, I don't know what happens if you put Wake Up into Google, but uh, you probably won't find our website. But if you go to wkup.org, uh, you will find a website with uh, this practice, but shared in a way which is accessible, we hope, um, to young people. And we found that uh, very quickly we've had a you know, very, very positive response um, because we have... I think as you've all experienced this incredible uh, suite of tools to address the suffering of modern life. And um, basically, yeah, this is just our aspiration to find ways to share it more widely with, uh, with people. So maybe I'll pass on to my brother, Brother, Spirit, uh, brother Stream, and he can uh, share more with you. Yeah. So dear friends, um, so basically we want to find a way when people find their hermit to keep it alive. And that's um, done, we found best by community. So we tried to create uh, uh, um, spaces for young people to come to and then have them run it themselves. So we hope something like this can happen at Google, that you can uh, come together. We know that uh, Meng and many others have created wonderful uh, spaces already uh, where mindfulness can come in to, to your lives here at Google. We're, we're looking for ways to, to put it out there. One of the ways we're doing it is by going to college campuses. Um, we've gone to the UK this spring, to Cambridge, Oxford, Leeds, a bunch of universities, and brought the practice right there into the, in, into the spaces where the students are. And um, we do mindful eating, everything we're gonna do today. And this fall, we're doing a tour in the US, in the Northeast, so we're going to, we've been invited to Harvard, Dartmouth, Columbia, a bunch of places, Georgetown. We're also going into detention centers and prisons where young people, um, you know, teenagers, 20, people in their 20s for various reasons are in jail, but we want to bring this practice to them so they can have something that they can do to transform their, 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 their being, you know, their way of being. Um, my, we, we look at Wake Up as a grassroots movement, yeah? It's, not, it's, it's inspired by Thai, but it's, it's inspired by the Buddha, but it's available for everyone. So the practice like total relaxation that we will learn later on today has been very popular with young people. We've had flash mob meditation sessions in <laughs> London, and they're becoming, they're becoming like uh, little wildfires growing everywhere, yeah? Of peace and calm in a way that people can relate, yeah? They can see that young people are doing something. It's not violent, it's not aggressive, but it's actually transforming themselves inside. So any way that uh, you guys feel inspired to help here at Google, we are, we're really open to hearing how you, um, what ways we can, we can extend this. We know that some people here know how to build websites, maybe. <laughs> For example, <laughs> that's one way we can get into people's lives, that we can really um, you know, come right into the rooms themselves and, and share this practice with them. So, please uh, help us. We, the, the website for Wake Up, like my brother said, is wkup.org. There's a US uh, site for that that will be um, tracking the tour that will happen from October 20th till November 10th. 
and that's us.wkup.org. So please uh, check it out and write to us if you have any ideas. Um, we're very open. We want to make this uh, grow as big as possible. So thank you for your support. So dear respected teacher and dear friends, on um, behalf of Plum Village and um, Plum Village delegations, we would like to take this opportunity to um, thank you. Thank you so much for having us here today. It's such a privilege to be here. So in gratitude, we have a very special gift that actually uh, written by our teacher that we'd like to offer to um, Google. And um, um, and we would like to offer us to um, Olivia's on behalf of Google. So please accept this present. I do. Thank you. And um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, and in addition to this, we also have a few books, and these are just the two brand new books of our teacher. The um, title is Peace is Every Breath. It's a meditation for busy people. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought it's probably suitable for you. So, <laughs> so here it is. Thank you so much. Would you like to open it to see what it is? Should I open it? Sure. Okay. okay. So in addition, we also have a few gifts for um, the organizers. <laughs> so first, we would like to offer this to um, Olivia. Thank you so much for helping us to organize this event. So without you, this probably is going to be, it may not happen. So thank you so much. Mm. You. And um, we also would like to have a gift for um, Katrina, so thank you for helping to organize. And the last one that we have is for Mina. Okay, thank you, Mina. Thank you so much. Uh, we have some gifts for you. This is actually for Ty, but he's not here now. But uh, you don't have to open everything, but maybe you would take the the top gift and uh, wear it in, in place of Thai. <laughs> so this, this is what a new hire at Googler wears. <laughs> and if they are mindful, they don't have to wear it for as long. <laughs> Lillian, would you come up? We have a gift for you. And Brother Fap Nguyen, we have a gift for you. And then I have um, 70 pieces um, for each one of you. Maybe you would demonstrate um, and wear one. 
If you remove the battery, take take this away, yes, and turn it. Complicate Google gadget. I need engineering here. Anyway, it flashes. Um, they're red, yellow, and um, other colored lights. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. This is a wonderful connection for us. And now, um, I think we'll give the instructions for the walking meditation. So maybe we'll come back in five minutes. And then we'll... In five minutes. All right, you get five minutes. Thank you. Thank you.